Anytime a child goes missing, it's a scary thing. You know there's evil out there. First, Michelle. It was terrifying. Then Jenny. Bloodhounds came. Police were late. Riding a bike. Somebody who's targeting young girls. Exactly. As a little kid, it definitely scared the heck out of me. She was a girl then, too. Solving these mysteries became her mission. So how many names did you have? About 2,300 names. Could cutting-edge technology crack an ice-cold case? Inside the mysteries almost too baffling to solve. I'm Lester Holt, and this is Dateline. Here's Keith Morrison with Evil Was Watching. Walked the damp, narrow paths to the places the killer used to hide what he had done, as if looking once more after all these years would tell her something, as if the dense undergrowth would part and finally reveal a name. That's for sure. No, no, and nothing like this has ever happened at this park before. Lindsay Waite was just 11 years old that terrible summer in Tacoma, Washington. I just remember that it was really scary to me as a young girl. It was really... ...through the ranks of the Tacoma Police Department until, as Detective Lindsay Wade, she came here to wrestle with something like an obsession. A mystery that lay dormant for more than three decades. A story that can finally be told. Easy, she said, after her husband left her, to raise three girls alone. But here in Tacoma, Barbara had at last found a good job, a home, and prospects. I was working in a real estate office and had just bought a house in the north end of Tacoma. Okay. Scraped and saved money. Even a little extra to sign up her daughter. She wasn't a rebellious child, but kids at that age want to be a little more independent. And it was spring break, so Michelle begged her mom. She wanted to go to the park with her sisters and be there before the piano lesson. Puget Park, a patch of green on the north end of Tacoma, just across... Like two and a half hours from... Freedom. They rode their bikes to the park, where they realized they'd forgotten their lunches at home. So Michelle was just like, oh, oh I'll go grab them and yeah. come back. And then in the meantime, we had to go to the bathroom, and so... There's no bathroom at the playground back then but she wasn't her bike was there and it was locked and we started looking we have this family call mm -hmm. and it and it echoes just far and wide and so we What's were the family call Woo! yeah okay yeah and so we you hooed for her mm -hmm. and we didn't hear anything I just knew something had happened yeah that it was there was it was wrong it was very something wrong was really wrong I left work I remember that day and just I was praying I wouldn't get a speeding ticket, but I was probably doing 70 miles an hour on the little road. Do you remember what that was like? It was terrifying. You're hoping you're going to see the kid come walking. Like that. Anytime a child goes missing, um, it's, it's a scary thing. Where was Michelle? The police looked, of course. But as the hours tick by, my God, there's nothing. There's an emptiness there. You just... Time. They said we're going to call in search and rescue because we haven't found her. It was late when they took search dogs into a nearby overgrown gulch. And then... I was in one of the police cars and they told me that... that they'd found her body. And, you know, when you're safe. They found her near a makeshift fire pit. She had been beaten and sexually assaulted. Her throat cut. It's this, this sickening feeling that just overtakes you and life is never going to be the same as you know it. And I think that it does one of two mates told the police she saw a man in the park looking at the girls. They made a sketch and tips flooded in. One of them seemed especially worrisome. A man out jogging reported seeing someone who looked like the sketch in a different park, a place called Point Defiance Park, a few miles away. Scout in her car. I'd go pull up at a stoplight, and I remember looking over, and there was a man in the car, and I was thinking, could you have done this? Did you do this? 
because they had no clues for months, months and months. And it was fog. you just living in a fog. Then it was summer. A little late. Just the two of them, Patty Bastion and her 13-year-old Jenny. And we were sitting in the dining room on the floor in front of the patio doors, bathing ourselves in the sun. A moment in time so treasured and so terribly... Another anguished family, another awful search. There were literally hundreds of people looking through the park for her. Everybody wanted to find Jenny. A sun-kissed morning. A few miles from the park where they'd found Michelle's body, Patty Bastian was enjoying a quiet moment at home with the younger of her two daughters, Jenny, a blonde, blue-eyed dynamo. If there was a ball, she had it in her hand. If there was a bat, she had it in her hand. Buddy to be waiting for her. She wanted to have the stamina to keep up. She'd planned a training ride with a friend. The friend backed out. And so that sunny day, August 4th... Jenny called her dad and asked for permission to do the five-mile drive around Point Defiance Park by herself. And he said yes, but be Tacoma's huge and loved urban forest park. Jenny's older sister, Teresa, 15 at the time, worked at a day camp there. It's majestic. I mean, all these overdone, you know, words of the poets don't begin to describe the, just the primeval forest, and it's beautiful. And the day just becomes like any other day until a phone call comes in the evening. It's my husband saying that I need to come home. Jenny was hours late. Patty heard the fear in her husband's voice. She drove home, terrified. Police were looking in the park. Bloodhounds. Oh they want a piece of Jennifer's clothing, something they can get a scent off of. They didn't find Jenny that night or the next day. Tacoma police closed Point Defiance Park for three days. Hundreds of people joined the search. NBC affiliate. Remember, any little bit would help. Meanwhile, police worked the angles. Was it a kidnapping? Maybe they were going to ask for ransom or... We just didn't know. Or maybe Jenny got lost or was badly hurt. There were literally hundreds of people. Look, call in and say, I think I saw her here. I think I saw her there. Patty waited, still hoping her Jenny would walk right in the door. She was at home when she got a visit from another mother, Barbara, Michelle's mom, there to offer support. It just seemed like the thing to do. She was very, very tame. Jennifer's not dead. You represented the outcome she desperately did not want to Ex have happen. Exactly, exactly. And she didn't want that to be her reality. But was it? It seemed like all of Tacoma feared the worst. After about, I don't know, 20 days, I decided I... And that's where she was when the detective arrived. Took the brush or roller out of my hand, sat helped me down the ladder, sat me on the chair in the dining room, and said, we found her. Today's date is August 29th. This is police video from the next day. They had found Jenny and bicycle. And a second mother learned all about permanent heartbreak. Have you let your mind go to what probably happened to her that day? I have my fairy tale, I think. And I'll just live with it. Um, she was riding her bike. Twice in five months. And the victims, very similar. Blonde, blue-eyed, riding a bike in a city park. And after, kids in Tacoma lost the freedom to roam alone, just like that. Turned on a dime after Yes, Jenny. it did. It was immediate. Or to be found. Everybody, it seemed, wanted to help the police. At one point, I think we were up to nine or ten binders full of just tips. And it was everything from, I saw a strange person in the park that day, mm -hmm. to um, my neighbor has got issues. And he was familiar with Point Defiance. He was familiar with the five-mile drive. They took a good hard look at him. But 
dead end. Dead end. Mm-hmm. There were many dead ends that year and in the years that followed. The police collected all the evidence they could, but went cold. It changed the way people thought of other people when the bad guy's still out there and when you don't know who the bad guy is. The whole town kind of carries it around. Absolutely. Absolutely. Miller carried it around, too, for two decades. And then he met a young detective. It definitely scared the heck out of me. Another detective joins the case. And after all these years, old evidence is about to yield a new clue. It was a shocker. When Dateline continues. And friends with Michelle or Jenny, but she certainly could have been. I definitely, I guess, identified with a little girl out riding her bicycle. Oh, sure. She was 11 years old back then in the summer of 1986. And because she lived in Tacoma, of course she heard about those girls. Just times where if I was out riding my bike or if I was walking, it would be something that I would think about. The layer of that glossy childhood varnish forever stripped away. Probably for the first time made us um, recognize that you know, there's really bad people out there. It takes away a little innocent killer, Ted Bundy. Who was from here? Who's from Tacoma, yes. And I was fascinated by the book and terrified at the same time. And I just decided that that's what I wanted to do for a living. I wanted to catch people like him. And Michelle, in the summer of 86. I would have a suspect that I was working and I would wonder, okay, could this guy be responsible? The mystery kept its grip on Gene Miller, too. Inspired him to start a cold case unit here. I mean, Detective Wade joined him, eager to dig into the case of Michelle and Jenny. Binders and binders of police reports and interviews and leads, 27 years of dead ends. And point defiance, like a giant, ever-present question. So her bicycle was back here and then laid them across the top of the bike to camouflage it. And further down the path, deeper into the woods, where they found Jenny, hidden from view. Very hidden. They discovered her body in a shelter of sorts. One of the original detectives actually described it. For me, as an investigator, it was important for me to come out here and actually see it, Mm -hmm. to try to understand a little bit better what happened and try to get myself into the mindset of the killer. I mean, there were days when I would get frustrated sitting in my office working on the case, and I would just drive down here and park my car and sit down here, hoping... Witnesses. Any male who had intersected with the original investigation. So how many names did you have? About 2,300 names. That's a lot of names. Yes. My working theory at that time was, this guy has got to be somebody who's been convicted of a sex crime or another murder. It didn't match anyone in the FBI's national DNA database known as CODIS. They didn't have any DNA from Jenny's body, though they did still have the swimsuit she'd been wearing that day, so Detective Wade sent that out for testing. When the crime lab looked at the swimsuit... Now, finally, they had a way to prove it. But when they compared the two DNA samples... It was... uh, a shocker. Coming up... I was absolutely dumbfounded. A revelation is about to change the case. I'm going to give it a shot. Michelle was so fierce. (laughs) Sister followed them all around their growing up years and when they had families of their own. And they knew, always did, that their mom had lost a piece of herself. We'd be all together in this family environment and, and then this just closing would come down yeah, over her. Yeah, she'd just ball. Yep, you want. Or thought they knew was that some unknown man assaulted and killed those little girls. This man who'd killed once had killed again. Absolutely. 
There couldn't be two monsters in Tacoma. But they were wrong. DNA doesn't lie. And the male DNA found on Jenny's swimsuit. I don't think I could speak. I was like, no way. I think we were all just, we had to kind of take a moment <laughs> sure. to regroup. Yeah. Because all this time you're looking for one thing and it's actually something else. Mm -hmm. But it was exciting at the same time because now we had a new lead. The DNA, no match. Once again, they seem to be right back where they started. You're just in the hurry up and wait mode. You're waiting um, for your offender to get their DNA in the database because of a conviction or whatever. Um, and that could be a long wait. In two th Patty, 29 years after her daughter's murder. My career was winding down. I thought I should probably do something. And so I volunteered to help. Patty wasn't allowed to touch the two girls' murder files, but she could help in other ways. And we just hit it off. Help us make our jobs easier. Around then, Detective Wade decided to try something new with the crime scene DNA. She consulted this woman, Dr. Colleen Fitzpatrick, an expert in something called forensic genealogy. In an informal sense, it's been referred to as... ...filed to public genealogy websites. Dr. Fitzpatrick searches all that DNA data to find not necessarily matches, but telling similarities. It's really the first big development in human identification, I think, in years, in 20 years. Her method can leak... Kind of sounded like smoke and mirrors to me, but I thought, well, I'm going to give it a shot. I mean, I want to solve this case. Yeah. She sent Dr. Fitzpatrick the two DNA profiles from Michelle's and Jenny's crime scenes. And she did her magic. She entered in, into her genealogy databases. There were no. The only name that seemed remotely interesting was Washburn, because there was a guy by that name in the case file, but he wasn't a suspect. He was a witness. He was the jogger who told police he saw someone in Point Defiance Park who resembled the sketch of Michelle's killer. But even more confusing, Dr. Fitzpatrick's tip about Michelle. So, it was all just a fluke, probably. And so, it was something that I kept in the back of my mind as we continued on with the investigation. She also went to a company called Parabon that turned DNA profiles into computer-generated images, showing what the suspect told the public they were searching for two killers and needed help to find them. Jenny's sister, Teresa, was hopeful. I didn't know exactly where it was going to end up, but I knew it was a big step in the case. We had a tip line open, and we got multiple tips on the same person because he actually looked so much like... Lists she'd made. 2,300 men connected to the two cases. She couldn't test all of them against the crime scene DNA, but... There were several hundred that really did stand out because they did have documented history for violence and sexual assault. So she set out to Clashburn. And though they were scattered all over the country, with the FBI's help, one by one, she tracked them down. We asked people, knocked on their door, literally told them we were investigating a cold case, and, you know, we're, we'd like to eliminate you as a potential suspect. Would you give us your DNA? We had, in total, about... Easier said than done. Isn't like the movies. This would take months. No idea if any of it would pay off. Coming up. So, first batch goes out there, none of these guys were a match. Then I send the next batch out, and it's the same thing. Weeks. Menus. Four more seasons came and went in Tacoma, Washington. As they're looking for two killers. First batch goes out there. I wait months, months, and months, and then, you know, get a report back that none of these guys are a match. Hmm. And then I send the next batch out, and it's the same thing. It was really frustrating because there were some... It was enough to wear any detective down, even one as passionate as Lindsay Wade. She'd given her best, but now she made a tough decision. 
it was time for me to move on. In the spring of 2018, Lindsay Wade retired from the Tacoma PD. She'd investigated both Jenny and Michelle's cases for... She's a very special gal. Hmm. I told her mother I'm going to adopt her. <laughs> <laughs> Before she left, Wade sent one last small batch of samples to the DNA lab. No point really in waiting for the results. We're down to the last 18. I'm doubtful that phone buzzed and I looked down. It was her replacement on the cold case unit. I answered the phone and he said, there's a match on Jennifer Bastian. I asked, who, who is it? What's the name? Huh? And he said, Robert Washburn? And I was like, no way. I knew exactly. He was never a suspect on her short list only because of that genealogy analysis. Why did Washburn's name end up on the list to be tested for DNA? Because of his last name. Just the last name? Yes. Because he was in that list that was sent to you? Correct. At the time, it seemed like a coincidence. The thing is that he was not a high-priority suspect. He certainly hadn't acted like one. They learned that in the years after the murder-rape of Jenny Bastian, Robert Washburn just blended into middle America, literally. He moved to Illinois, got a job, paid his taxes, stayed out of trouble. After that terrible day in the park, Washburn was arrested at home. And then the new cold case detective, Steve Riopel, spoke with him. How did he react? He was scared. He was uh, very nervous. He was sweating. He asked me, is this about that swab I gave the FBI? And that job went to retired detective Wade. So, of course, I had rehearsed what I was going to say, and, and it all went out the window by the time I got there. I couldn't <laughs> remember what I was going to say. And... and she walked in. I could tell she had been crying. And she said, we got him. After 32 years, Jenny's alleged killer was finally in custody. But what about Michelle's murderer? His identity was still a mystery. Of the 160 men whose DNA was tested, none matched. Did you get to the point where you... But I did not ever want that to happen to other children. So in my mind, it would be a great idea to find this guy. Remember, back in 2016, Parabon made a sketch based on the suspect's DNA, but it didn't lead to a suspect. So, in 2018... How could you find somebody? How could somebody still be out there? One mother still seeking answers, and one more phone call from out of the blue. I believe in the devil, and people that don't believe in the devil, I think they're in for a big surprise. It's a big hole that nothing else can fit, no amount of comfort. The loss of her daughter, Michelle, hit Barbara Leonard like one of the sufferings of Job. And the grief... There's never an end to it. And there won't be, I don't think, until I see her again and I have that hope and promise. To maintain a relationship and understand other people's pain. Of course, Barbara was glad for the Bastion family when she heard there'd been an arrest in Jenny's case in May 2018. But she knew it wouldn't shed any light on Michelle's murder. It was two different people, two different distinct... Until June 20th, 2018, when Barbara's phone rang. Police chief calls and says, we've apprehended the man we feel is responsible for your daughter's murder. After 32 years... The breakthrough was, once again, genealogical DNA. Added one of the brothers to a restaurant where he got lucky. I observed him uh, using the napkin multiple times, and I was able to uh, collect it and get that submitted to the lab. And it was a match. It was surreal because after all this time, how could you find somebody? A working class guy with no history of violent crime just like Robert Washburn. I believe in the devil. I believe fully in the devil. And people that don't believe in the devil, I think they're in for a big surprise. Barbara Leonard and her daughters were in court the day Hartman was charged with Michelle's murder. Hartman pleaded not guilty to first-degree murder. His trial is scheduled for next month. His attorney sent us a letter which reads in part, 
The defense is pursuing various investigative leads. I ask the public accord Mr. Hartman the presumption of innocence to which he is entitled. In January, Robert Washburn was guilty to first-degree murder. He was sentenced to 27 years in prison. I had prayed that he would not go to trial. I just wanted it to be over. As part of the plea agreement, Washburn had to tell the court about the murder. In a statement read by the judge, he said he grabbed Jenny by the arm. So you woke up on August 4th. It was a beautiful sunny day. You went to the park. Did you intend to kill a little girl? Why? Why did you do this? Did you know what you did? You know? Question or any hope that he will. Yes. Yes. And the reason for that is not for me. The reason is for future. Mm. To help psychologists, parents, detectives understand. Call in a tip about Michelle's murder months before he killed Jenny. That's another question that we would all like to know the answer to. Could he have been planning it all that time? I don't know. Watching for somebody? Certainly possible. After 32 years, turn DNA collection and make sure it gets into a national registry right away. It's called Jennifer and Michelle's Law. What would it mean to you to have such a law named after your daughter? It would be great. It would be terrific to memorialize these two girls that... On a sunny day... That's all for this edition of Dateline. We'll see you again next Friday at 10, 9 central. And of course, I'll see you each weeknight for NBC Nightly News. I'm Lester.